Uh, let me ask you, Lindsay German in London, um, so far, uh, the bloodbath that, that many had predicted for Tripoli has not played out. Um, are you relieved? Well, of course, I think nobody wants a bloodbath anywhere, although we should remember that the heaviest bombardment by NATO has been in the last two days on Tripoli. So the idea that this all happened in the past and this is just the rebels uh, carrying out their victory now is, is not actually the case. Uh, NATO is very, very directly intervening right up to the last minute. And I think that the, uh, the Libyans will... Uh, become aware that NATO will not easily give up. They made a statement yesterday saying that they're willing to work with the with a new government in uh, in Libya, which um, uh, is it gives you some idea of them seeing how, what a central role that they have here. Uh, uh, Richard Dalton, when you when you hear what Lindsay j just said there, and uh, Philip Stoner mentioning how um, you have uh, uh, you do have. Uh, these uh, special forces in the background, perhaps ha helping the, uh, holding the hand, if you will, uh, for the rebels who did not know how to fight. Uh, and Phil and uh, Chris Moore can attest to that uh, when he was there back in April. Um, uh, can, can what can the uh, Transitional National Council do without NATO? Well, it can do almost everything except bomb targets from the air. Uh, this campaign has gone well in the last few weeks because of the efforts of the infantry on the ground, uh, with key targets being taken out from the air. But no war was ever won from the air. And I did, before this idea that there was a major role by special forces uh, takes hold, uh, I think I should make uh, this is nothing but rumour. Uh, there were some stories six weeks ago about uh, Westerners who could have been special forces, uh, but nobody has owned up to it. and. Uh, if there was a role for outsiders, it has been very limited. Christopher Moore, your thoughts? Well, I think uh, I'm, not, I'm not in a position to uh, speculate <laughs> on the special forces angle, having not been in Libya uh, myself uh, since, uh, as you said, uh, April. Um, it is very clear that uh, the NATO, in the past sort of few weeks or so, NATO has really uh, upped. But tell, uh, me about, tell me about the fighters that you saw when you were in Benghazi back in April. Back in April in Benghazi, they were enthusiastic, though not necessarily uh, the best uh, equipped or trained fighters. For so I mean, they were they would tell you regularly that they were going to make their way uh, all the way to Tripoli and do various horrible things to uh, Colonel Gaddafi. In the end, uh, once NATO had intervened, the front line was pretty much being held by NATO somewhere between uh, Adj Dabia and Brega, not so far down the road uh, from uh, Benghazi. Now, NATO could stop uh, the Gaddafi troops advancing any further towards Adj Dabia. They could encourage even or give encouragement to the rebels to go forward up to Brega. You'd hear on a virtually daily basis that the rebels were about to take Brega. <laughs> Uh, but we were still hearing that two or three days ago. It never really uh, happened. Uh, their, their operation wouldn't have worked in any way without, without NATO, of course. Uh, Captain Stoner, uh, motivate, if you're motivated but completely unqualified, how long does it take to make you into a soldier? Well, I mean, you know, if you're really motivated, it's amazing what you can do uh, in, in a very short space of time. But I think, you know, Richard Dalton's point is absolutely right mm -hmm. from the point of view that it is only rumour about the issue of special forces. But that's exactly how the special forces, if indeed they were involved, would like to have it. Um, it but you're looking at the facts on the ground. It would have been absolutely impossible for the rebels to achieve what they have achieved, not only by having the heavy uh, air power support from, 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 from NATO, having the intelligence coming from drones, no doubt supplied by the Americans, without connecting that some way to them on the ground. And that would have been done by certain people who've been infiltrated in on the ground in, play clo in plain clothes. I'll tell you what's improved in the last uh, couple of weeks, really, is that level of coordination. It's been something which was talked about Absolutely, Absolutely right from the start of uh, this uh, armed conflict, but it never really became reality until very, very recently. Now, of course, at the center of it all, there's uh, still one man who's uh, yet to be accounted for. We're talking about uh, the Libyan leader of nearly 42 years, Muammar Gaddafi, um, who's always said um, he's going to be staying put, like uh, he said it on the radio less than 24 hours ago. He's been saying it ever since this conflict began. Let's listen to what he told, uh, he said back in March. Why would I leave? Who would take my place? I don't have the authority to do that. I am not a president or a head of government. I am from the people. 
Richard Dalton, what are Muammar Gaddafi's options and what do you suspect he'll do? We don't know what's in his mind. Uh, he sees himself as having a historic mission and uh, I suspect he won't accept until the very, very last minute that all is up and this has failed. So he might die in the fighting, he might be captured, uh, he might be in a location outside Tripoli and be not telling the truth when he says uh, he is in Tripoli. Uh, he might therefore want to try and maintain resistance from that situation to, to try and mount a last stand somewhere perhaps in the south of Libya. Uh, but uh, I think that the, the, the most likely option is uh, that he will be caught up with one way or another uh, and that he will be uh, captured. Now, at that point, the uh, national authorities of Libya, uh, once they've constituted themselves, will have to decide if they want him tried in Libya or submitted to the International Criminal Court. Uh, and we don't know what they will decide. Um, uh, the issue about what will happen to Muammar Gaddafi um, is one issue. But uh, let me just ask you, Richard Dalton, from your experience as being the, the, the British ambassador uh, in, in Libya, uh, Gaddafi ha has been painted as a man of the 60s who fancies himself kind of like Che Guevara. Uh, do you see him uh, actually handing himself in? He'll be extremely reluctant to do so. Uh, he will find it very hard to, to believe uh, the truth of the, the, the collapse of his support, if, if that's indeed what happens in the next few days in Tripoli. Uh, and uh, I don't see him voluntarily taking the exile route. Um, Philip Stoner, uh, on this show in the past, we've openly speculated when we've seen NATO bombings on his compound about mm. whether or not there was an untold mission to, well, for NATO to take him out. Uh, at, at this point in time, what is NATO's mission when it comes to Muammar Gaddafi? I think, in, as far as NATO is concerned at the moment, and you know, listening to what uh, Anders Falk uh, Rasmussen said uh, this morning, um, it, NATO really is in a position where it has to take a step back uh, and realize that so far, as far as NATO is concerned, one might have different views elsewhere, but as far as NATO is concerned, so far so good. Um, but what they mustn't do now is get wrapped up in a situation where they are trying to sort of help out the rebels, the freedom fighters, too much and, and start to take over this particular, uh, this particular war. Uh, it's, it's quite remarkable that they've got this stage, but now they need to actually take a step back. Lindsay German, what's the best case scenario now when it comes to uh, uh, what happens to Muammar Gaddafi? Well, it's clear that Gaddafi is finished as a ruler of, uh, of Libya. Um, I'm against him being tried in the International Criminal Court. I think that the, the whole setup with the court is one of hypocrisy, where the uh, uh, people like George Bush and Tony Blair are never indicted, but it's always, uh, it's always uh, supposed war criminals who are treated like this, who are enemies of the West. So I, I think it's up to the Libyan people to decide what they do with Gaddafi. As I think it's up to the Libyan people to decide what they do with their country. And the absolute minimum is that the NATO uh, intervention has to stop, that all special forces have to be removed, that this should be Libya for the Libyans. This is what uh, David Cameron and Nicolas Sarkozy claim that they want. This is what now has to happen. Because what I fear with this is that we have now the rehabilitation of so-called humanitarian intervention. This has been discredited very widely in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, it, one of the aims, I think, of what's happened in Libya was to re-establish humanitarian intervention as something that the West was allowed to do. And it will be very dangerous if this spreads to Syria and elsewhere in the Middle East. Uh, so what you're saying, in effect, is that uh, on the tail end of this, there shouldn't be threats to intervene in places like Syria? There shouldn't be threats to intervene anywhere else. These Middle East uprisings, the Arab Spring, were the act of the Arab people themselves. They did tremendously to overthrow the Tunisian and Egyptian presidents in the teeth of opposition, among others, from uh, the British and the EU, at least to start with. You wouldn't think so now, but that was actually the situation. They used the, uh, in, uh, the growing civil war in, in Libya to intervene. They want to intervene in Syria, but they are very nervous about intervening in Syria. 
uh, success for them in Libya should not be used as the idea that they can go and intervene elsewhere because we have in the Middle East a very dangerous situation. We have uh, a whole series of countries that, are, that have dictators or despots who, who run them. If you look at what happened, the, what coincided with the intervention in Libya, the beginning of the bombing, was also the Saudi crackdown on Bahrain. These are all things that are connected. It was the attempt to stop the Arab Spring going in the direction which they thought would be dangerous for Western interests. And the worst thing for the people of the Middle East is more Western intervention now. Uh, Richard Dalton, uh, your, your thoughts briefly before we go to the break on the issue of uh, uh, wh what lessons will be drawn from uh, the way NATO handled itself? Uh, the right or duty to intervene where a government isn't respecting the rights of its citizens in a, to a massive degree uh, is circumscribed in international law uh, and the, the right to mandate that activity lies in the United Nations, in the Security Council in particular. And, of course, nobody is going to ask the Security Council for such a mandate in future unless there is regional support for the intervention. I think that's what the Libya uh, precedent shows, is that in the right circumstances, where the problem is not so great or there is no one state which is acting as patron or protector of the offending state, uh, that the international community can get involved and stay within the terms of the mandate given it uh, through the UN. Through the UN. We're going to pick up on that point uh, when we come back. Stay with us. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. This is the France 24 debate. Uh, we're discussing Muammar Gaddafi's downfall and talking about it with uh, uh, Sir Richard Dalton, the former British ambassador to Libya, um, who is now with the British think tank Chatham House. Also with us, Captain Philip Stoner, former deputy UK defense attaché uh, here in Paris. Chris Moore, France 24 uh, uh, reporter, um, who is off to Libya in the morning, as, as it were. And uh, from London, Lindsay German of the Stop the War Coalition. Thanks, uh, all of you, for being back with us. Just before the break, we were uh, discussing uh, the issue uh, about uh, the, the uh, we were discussing the issue of uh, was it worth it to uh, intervene and uh, critics at the outset of the intervention uh, of the NATO intervention in this country accusing President Sarkozy of taking his orders from French philosopher Bernard-Henri Lévy who pleaded for that intervention ahead of the UN resolution we were discussing. Now five months on uh, Paris says it now feels vindicated. Let's listen to the foreign minister. We've made it very clear that we're working within the remit of international law. So this is the result. We spoke of not getting bogged down. You remember it was going to be in six months that we would reach our objectives. Some say it took too long. But we've demonstrated that we are determined and discerning in the decisions we've made. Now, if we look at a couple of the comments from the France 24 debate Facebook page, uh, there's um, quite an argument going on here. Andrew writes, we had no choice after the threat made to civilians in Benghazi. If we had done nothing, there'd be one million refugees in Egypt and probably a similar number of bodies in the Mediterranean. Now, Don from Harare disagrees. He says NATO should have left it to the Libyan people. The rebels will form a Western imposed government. Richard Dalton, how difficult will it now be for that transitional national council um, really to uh, be a legitimate force? It will be difficult, but they are making a good start with the constitutional declaration they have announced, providing for the steps leading to a pluralistic Libya that is better governed in accordance with law and human rights and uh, freedom. So they now have to attract the support of the overwhelming majority in order to make those aspirations real. And from my experience of Eastern Libya and from my time in Libya itself as a whole, I believe that they will be able to do so. Uh, there are several dangers. One is that the uh, military forces who are in the, in the process of defeating Qadhafi's forces on the battlefield will be hard to control. Uh, another is that there will be rivalries within the National Transitional Council itself. But I don't believe that these are insuperable. 
Uh, and, and drawing from your experience uh, when you were in the country, the, the, you were in a country that didn't have political parties, where tribal affiliations uh, run very strong. Um, how do you basically do it from scratch? I don't believe that tribal affiliations run very strong. Uh, this has become one of the many myths of the last six months. Uh, the primary loyalty of Libyans is to their family and to their country. Uh, they know the tribe they come from in many cases, not all, uh, but they're not a people that lives in the countryside or in the desert. They live largely in cities and in towns. And there, as in other parts of the world, tribal lo loyalties are regarded as thoroughly out of date. The only circumstances in which people would rally to a tribe uh, is if there is a prolonged period of anarchy in Libya with all forms of hope for better social and political organization lost. And that is simply not going to happen. We should not underestimate the sense of public duty and loyalty which Libyans have to their country. And in the light of the dreadful experiences they've been through, particularly uh, in the main cities, uh, in the course of fighting Colonel Qaddafi's forces, I believe that they will rally to the opportunity which their fighters on the ground have now given them for a new start. Uh, Chris Moore, when you were uh, in Benghazi, uh, there's, we know there's a lot of talk about how Benghazi is proud of being different from Tripoli. Did you, did you have the sense uh, the, did you, the, of, a, of a Libya the way it, it's portrayed there by Richard Dalton as uh, one nation indivisible? I think there's quite a lot of truth in what he says in the sense that uh, regional or tribal identities, they could be they could be important. It could be, for example, if you're French, you might regard yourself, first of all, as Breton, you know, from Brittany, but you're still French. And uh, I think it's perhaps a similar uh, situation uh, in Libya. I mean, it was that there, there's a strong sense of national pride, at least uh, in Benghazi. You see that now when there's a lot of demands uh, from within the council itself saying, look, the minute that Gaddafi is gone, this is a, a Libyan uh, gig for, li for Libyan people. Uh, if you like, they don't want uh, any more intervention from NATO. When you hear um, figures within inside the National Council saying that, no, we're not sure that we're going to hand Saif uh, al-Islam over to the uh, ICC yet. We want him perhaps to be tried here in Libya. And uh, the same uh, for, uh, for Gaddafi. There's a strong sense of, of not necessarily nationalism, but national pride uh, about it. They acknowledge that NATO helped. They acknowledge that they couldn't have, uh, couldn't have won mm. without NATO, but they want this from now on to be uh, a Libyan operation for Libyan people. All right, and for the time being, the Transitional National Council predicting a speedy return to normal in Tripoli. We can hear um, a, one of their military spokesmen. A plan was agreed with groups inside of Tripoli to secure the city, to secure local and international organizations, and also to secure all private and public establishments. I think after today, and after the total freedom of the next few days, life will get back to normal. Uh, Lindsay German, are you reassured when you hear that statement? Uh, not particularly, because I think what the most likely outcome in, uh, in Libya is that there will be a government established, which is a pro-Western government. It will be probably a fairly weak government for the reasons that some of your uh, other contributors have already said, that it, um, it, there are many differences among the rebels, from Islamist to uh, pro-American uh, figures within it. So there will be a whole number of uh, differences. It will be quite a weak government. And to be perfectly honest, we've been here before. This is what uh, we had in Afghanistan. This is uh, the situation which still pertains in, uh, in Afghanistan. And that it doesn't mean, just because this stage of the fighting is over, it doesn't mean necessarily a war is over. I think we would all hope that it would be over, but I'm not sure it's at all the kind of um, the glib scenario that some government spokesmen are really talking about. And therefore, I think that when we look at it, the whole question of the intervention will shape it. It's very interesting 
what Chris says, that many Libyans say to him, we wanted NATO to help us, um, and now we don't want to be around. And that's exactly the sentiment that I've had from many Libyans uh, here in London. But the truth of the matter is, they won't find it very easy to get rid of NATO. They won't find it very easy to get rid of the Western powers. David Cameron has said, we, uh, we will be, uh, we've already had plans about how we stabilize the situation. The British do not have or do not have official troops on the ground, nor do any of the right, other I'm, I'm uh, sorry, NATO I'm going to, powers. Lindsay German, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to interrupt you for a second because we're going to go to Tripoli and France Van Ketz, uh, sure. Catherine Norris-Trent. Uh, uh, Catherine.